that he is a recent convert to the League of Extraordinary Bow Tie Wearers. <laughs> so, I mean, that's all right now I have an affinity for him, right? And so, but he's obviously a new convert, and one of the things that's cute about new converts is that they're gushing, right, about all the benefits of bow tie wearing, right? So we're sitting there, and somebody, you know, so, they're so convenient, they're so light, they pack so easily in your suitcase, uh, you know, they don't, you don't get in your soup when you lean over, I mean, just all these benefits. It's just so cute, it's adorable, really. And then, in addition, he's engaging in uh, bow tie evangelism, because we're sitting there trying to talk to Jonathan Shockey about how Man, you gotta, you gotta go. Once you go, you never go back. So I just, I mean, I don't know about you all, but it's my experience that if someone is up here and they're wearing a bow tie, they're going to be good looking, witty, and handsome, and funny. So welcome, Adam Andrew. Excellent. Thank you. Good morning. He's right. I'm a new convert. What do you think? Yeah, it's good, isn't it? I got one of the ones with four different patterns, so four ties in one. I'm all excited. It's true, you don't get it in your soup when you lean forward. I love it. Well, thank you, Kevin. I appreciate that introduction. It's great to be with you. My name is Adam Andrews, and as Kevin mentioned, I'm the director of Center for Lit, which is a one-horse homeschool curriculum outfit in Northeast Washington State, a long couple of plane flights from here. But I appreciate the invitation, and to tell you the truth, I'm humbled to be among you this morning, among people that, frankly, though I don't know you personally, I consider you role models and heroes. My wife and I are homeschoolers since day one. We have six children, uh, two of whom are out of college, two of whom are in college, and two of whom are planning to go to college in the near future. And I am continually amazed over the last 20 years or so at the work and sacrifice uh, laid on the field of battle by homeschool parents on a regular basis. I don't know if you stop to think very often about the kind of sacrifice you're making, except in those moments when you go, this is an amazing sacrifice, I can't believe I'm not getting more credit for this. <laughs> but I think it might do you good to hear from someone who has watched from the husbandly sideline for many years, to hear a description of what I think it is that you've been engaged in all this time. Despite amazing limitations of resources, financial and otherwise, limitations of time, limitations of your own training and education and experience, which you find sorely lacking most days, opposition from neighbors, opposition from family members, opposition from our society in general, from assumptions given to you by the government school system, by the media, by TV, movies, commercials, which say that it takes a legion of professionally trained, certified teachers to raise a single child. You have said, despite these limitations, despite this opposition, no, I think I can do it myself. I think I'm called to do this. I think I want to be the person on the scene when it goes down, when that light rises in that kid's eyes, and he starts to realize, oh, I'm a person. I am a thinking being. I am an eternal soul. What's in that book? I want to be the one on the scene when that happens. And despite all those limitations, despite all that opposition, I'm going to do it. And only then, after you make that decision, do you look around and say, how in the world am I going to do it? <laughs> and the fact that that question comes back with no real honest answer, you have no idea still, you persist. That is heroic stuff. That is heroic stuff. That's the kind of sacrifice, that's the kind of work that changes a civilization, that redirects its course. And I'm as proud as I can be to be among you. If there's anything that I can do or that Center for Lit can do to help you in that most noble task, you have only to ask. I hope that in the next hour I can encourage you in this task, maybe even give you a couple of practical tips not necessarily tips for the classroom. I realize that's not really the format of the meeting today. But tips for getting your mind focused on this task so that you can do it more effectively. In particular, I'd like to have a conversation this morning about our basic assumptions about why we're doing what we're doing as homeschoolers. The title of my talk is Homeschooling's Highest Goal. And far from standing up here and telling you what that is, in case you didn't know it, 
Andrews has the answer. He knows what homeschooling's highest goal is, and if you'll only take notes, your minds will be refocused on the truth. What I'd rather do is ask you, what is homeschooling's highest goal? How would you answer the question? Most of us would answer with some version of homeschooling's highest goal is a good education. We want to give our kids a good education. We want to beat the government school at its own game and do a better job than the establishment is currently doing. But that answer, if you think about it for a minute, begs a question. What do we mean by the term? What is an education, after all? What's an education? Let me ask you this question. Who is the most educated person with whom you have regular contact? Who is the most educated person in your life? Is it your mailman? Is it your kid's English teacher? Is it your lawyer? Is it your pastor? It's probably your doctor, isn't it? Most of us would say that our doctor is the most educated person that we have regular contact with. Why do we give him that title? Why is it the doctor that gets the medal? I'll tell you why. He's been to more school. He knows more things about the human body and its processes, about his particular domain of knowledge, than anybody else who has any sort of mastery of any domain of knowledge. The doctor knows a ton. And when we answer this question this way, we betray an assumption about education that I want to confront today and have a conversation about. The assumption that education is mastery. The assumption that in order to be educated, we must master ever more increasing domains of knowledge. And that as educators, it's our job to create little masters. Give them math. The math facts. If they can master the math facts, they are educated in that field. Give them Shakespeare. If they can master Shakespeare, they're educated in that field. Give them American history. If they can master American history, we have done our job. We have beat the public school at its own game. I want to suggest to you today in the comments that follow that we have a greater opportunity than that as homeschoolers. A greater opportunity than beating the public school at its own game we have the opportunity of playing a different game altogether. If we think carefully about what we mean by the term education, we have a chance to do something in our homes that will then leak out into the culture, redefine that term, and change the course of our civilization. I don't think that's an overstatement. But let me go on to talk about what I mean by the term education, and let's have a conversation about that. See if I can challenge some assumptions and make you think. See if I can get you to throw bricks at me by the time the hour is over. I want to start with another question. If you had only one hour to give your students an education, a complete education, what would you teach them? What would you fill that hour with? Our field is literature, reading comprehension, and literary analysis. So I want to give an example of the lesson that I would teach if I only had the one hour and see if this lesson doesn't challenge our assumptions about education and about our work as homeschoolers. I want to tell you a story from literature. This is one of the oldest stories in Western literature. In fact, one of the oldest stories in human literature. It's the story of Job from the Old Testament, one of the earliest works of literary art. And you'd know the story of Job, I'll bet. Most of you are familiar with the general outlines. I'm not going to read it to you. It's a little long for that. But we all know how Job begins, right? It begins with a description of the protagonist. It's a work of literature always has a protagonist, a main character. Who is this protagonist, Job? What do we know about him? Well, chapter 1 of the story tells us that Job is prosperous and upright. It describes his flocks and herds, his extra suits of clothes, his extra sons and daughters, his prosperous lifestyle. He is the envy of all around, rich and comfortable. And it also describes his religious rectitude. 
It describes how he makes regular sacrifices to God. In fact, he makes sacrifices on behalf of other people. You ever notice that? Job sacrifices to God on behalf of his children in case they have gotten off the rails and done something to anger God. And he goes around behind them, as it were, making sacrifices so that everything will be okay between God and his children. You might gather from this first description of our protagonist that he's made some assumptions about how the world works. He has connected his religious rectitude, his uprightness, his ability to make all the proper sacrifices with his prosperity. Job can be forgiven for making this connection, don't you think? After all, it seems to be working. He fears God. He is upright. He takes care of his family's religious position with respect to God, and God just rains the blessings down upon him. Rich beyond imagining, comfortable, prosperous, happy, fat. Job is loving it. We all know what happens next, don't we? Satan comes along and says, hey, God, what if I just went after Job a little bit? How would that be? And God says, for reasons that are inscrutable to us in the beginning of the story, go ahead. It always raises a question, doesn't it? Why in the world? In fact, that's kind of the point of the book of Job, isn't it? Why in the world? Well, never mind. We'll get to that later. First of all, Satan comes along, and God allows him to afflict Job beyond imagining. The devil takes his family takes his possessions, takes his health, strips him bare until all he can do in the end is sit in a pile of ashes and scrape his boils with a potsherd. In fact, Job's situation by the end of the first couple of chapters of the story is so dire that his wife advises him, his wife advises him to be done with it. Curse God, she says, and die awful helpful information, helpful advice there at the extremity of my suffering. Curse God and die, be done with it. Now, most of the book of Job takes place in a conversation around this sad little campfire where Job is sitting sprinkling dust on his head. It's a conversation between Job and three of his friends who have heard of his distress from afar and come to comfort him. And together, Job and his three friends try to make sense of what has happened. Because the most obvious thing about this situation is that it doesn't make sense. Job's friends think it doesn't make sense. Job thinks it doesn't make sense. We readers think it doesn't make sense. Now, Job and his friends are very wordy in their conversation. It's 35 chapters or so around and around the circle. Of course, there's not much else to do but talk. Job has no toys to play with anymore. But lest you fear that I'm going to subject you to every single comment, let me hasten to say that all of their comments, the three comforters and Job's himself, swirl around a single point. They're really saying the same thing over and over and over again. And I want to suggest to you what that point is by using their own words. First of all, Eliphaz the Temanite Comforter number one. Here's what he says in chapter eight. A couple different verses kind of stitched together. Remember now, Job, who ever perished being innocent? This is a rhetorical question, isn't it? What's the answer that he's looking for? Who ever perished being innocent? Nobody. It's rhetorical. Nobody ever perished being innocent. He goes on. Where were the upright ever cut off? Another rhetorical question. Answer, they weren't. Even as I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. By the blast of God, they perish. By the breath of his anger, they are consumed. Quick 21st century paraphrase of that passage. Bad guys get punished. Good guys don't. Since you're obviously being punished, you must be a bad guy. It seems pretty clear. God would not be cutting you off as he obviously is if you had played your cards right. 
Bildad the Shuhite comes up next. Oh, and by the way, Eliphaz says that over and over and over again throughout the 35 chapters. Bildad the Shuhite comes up next. Lest he be outdone by his friend Eliphaz, he says this. Does God subvert judgment, Job? Rhetorical question. Answer? No, he does not. He never does. Does the Almighty pervert justice? Rhetorical. No. Behold, God will not cast away the blameless, nor will he uphold evildoers. 21st century translation. God is not unfair. He always does the fair, just, and righteous thing. You always get what you deserve. Everything that God does to you is just. If God is doing bad things to you, you deserve it. Zophar is the third comforter. I can't remember where he's from. Zophar the North Carolinian. I can't remember. Zophar says this, Job, you have said, my doctrine is pure and I am clean in your eyes, but oh, that God would speak. Open his lips against you. Know, therefore, Job, that God exacts from you less than your iniquity deserves. 21st century translation, it's probably a lot worse than you're making out, a lot worse than you admit. God is going easy on you with the boils because God is just and merciful. You should be getting a lot worse than you are. Now, Job does not let these kinds of comfort go unanswered. If you've read the book of Job, you know that he gives as good as he gets at every point. He has his turn in every cycle of dialogue. Here's a smattering of what Job responds with in all these cases. These are quotes from chapters 23 and 31 and so forth. Oh, he says, that I knew where I might find him, speaking of God, that I might come to his seat. I would present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would speak to me. I would understand what he would say to me. He knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot has held fast to his steps. I have kept his way and not turned aside. I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Does he not see my ways? Does he not count all my steps? Let me be weighed on honest scales that God may know my integrity. 21st century translation, you are doing me wrong, God, and if you look closely, you would see that I have done everything right. I've pulled all the right levers in this game. I've made all the right sacrifices. I've done all the right things. It's really funny when you look at all these comments kind of as a group and see the underlying assumptions because it sounds for all the world like they're having a disagreement at the top of their lungs. They're screaming at each other, shaking their fists in each other's face. But really, they all agree absolutely about one fundamental assumption, which is that you get what you deserve, which is that God's heaven hangs levers down. And all that's necessary to open up the floodgates of heavenly blessing is to pull the levers correctly. If you go like this and pull them correctly, make the right sacrifices, do the right things, the gates will open and blessing and prosperity will rain down upon you. And if you pull the levers ill, then cursing and destruction and judgment will rain down upon you. And all that's necessary to control what comes down from heaven is to pull the right levers. And furthermore, all that's necessary to determine whether you've pulled the right levers is to see what's coming down from heaven. If you've got boils and your children have been swept away in a storm, you must have pulled levers wrong somewhere. Job and his comforters don't disagree about that. They agree about that absolutely. What they disagree on is whether Job has pulled the levers wrong or not. They say he has. He says he hasn't. They say, Job, you've done it wrong. He says, no. I've done it right. You've done it wrong. I've done it right. This is the trouble we readers have with this story, too. Looks for all the world to us like Job has done it right. We have the same question he has. What gives? I thought we pulled the levers correctly. Why the cursing? Why? 
One of the questions we often ask in a literary analysis of a story is, what does the protagonist want? The main character of the story, what does he want? Let's ask that question of this story right now. Knowing who the protagonist is and the situation he's in, not just in his physical circumstances, but also in his conversation with his friends. What is he after? Let me ask it this way. What would you be after? If you had just had all your possessions and your health and your family taken away for no apparent reason and you were sitting in a campfire sprinkling ashes on your head. Let me ask this question. Would you want your stuff back? I would. I would say, you took my stuff for no reason. I want my stuff back. Does Job want his stuff back? If so, he never mentions it once in 35 chapters of railing. How about this? If my children had been swept away in a storm, I would want my children back. Wouldn't you? Does Job want his children back? If so, he never mentions it. Pretty cold. His health. I would want my health. I would want the boils to go away. Does Job mention the boils? He does not. He doesn't seem to care about any of that stuff. But he's on and on and on about something. 35 chapters. Oh, that I could find him. Oh, that I could get to his seat. Oh, that I could fill my mouth with arguments and fill his ear with my case. He will find me justified in the end. What does he want more than anything? He wants to be right. He wants to be in the right. He wants to be justified. He wants it known among his three friends, among his family, among his world, that he was in the right, that God did him an injustice. He wants it to be true still, that the levers of heaven hang down within his reach, and all that's necessary to force the blessing of God from heaven is to pull them correctly. He wants to be the one with his hand on the levers, and to, be, to live in a universe where those levers work. That's the testimony of Job's own mouth. I'd like to think that I'm a better man than Job, that I would leave God's things to God, and what I'd really want is just some peace and comfort and my family and my stuff back. But I am plagued with doubts. In 20 years of homeschooling, I have found that my wife Missy and I homeschool for two sets of reasons. One very noble, one much darker. The noble set is that we want our children to have a good life. We want them to be educated people, to know how to correctly handle the world that the Lord is putting them in. The darker reason is that we want to appear as good teachers. We want to appear as good people. We want to appear as good parents. We want to be good. This darker desire has led us to use our children and their education to burnish our own reputations as teachers and as parents and as people. I find when I look into my own heart, the sin of Job is there alive and well. I want to be justified by the works of my own hands, by the things I do in the classroom every day, by the curricular decisions that I make, by the parental direction that I give to my kids. In every one of those noble actions, there is a diabolical lever pulling going on. I'm trying to force the blessings of God from heaven. I want the same thing Job wants. I stumble in the same darkness that plagues Job and his three friends. That's what I want. That's what Job wants. I don't want to go to meddling. But is that what you want too? Is there a part of us, all of us, that is a little idol builder, a little image builder, a little creator of good works with our own hands that will somehow get us the approval and blessing of God. The third question we always ask in a literary analysis after who is the protagonist and what does he want is why can't he have it? 
So let's ask that question of Job now. Why can't Job have the justification that he seeks? Why can't God just say, you know what, Job, it's true. You did it all right. I just let Satan beset you because I wanted to play this funky mind game on you. And sorry for the trouble. We'll now return things to how they were before. Why can't Job have that? Well, we get an answer to that question when a fourth comforter shows up on the scene, Elihu the Young. He has held his peace up until now because out of respect for the older comforters that have evidently been making a hash of it. So finally he steps in. He can't keep quiet any longer. And he says, I don't mean to be rude. I don't mean to interrupt, but you guys have got it all wrong. And he says this in chapter 35. Look to the heavens, Job, and see. Behold the clouds. They are higher than you. And Job goes, yeah, I see. What's your point? And then Elihu makes his point. Listen to this. He says, if you sin, what do you accomplish against God? Another rhetorical question, right? If you sin, what do you accomplish against God? Rhetorical. What's the answer? Nothing. Think about that for a minute. Elihu crossing all of their assumptions. If you sin, what do you accomplish against God? Nothing. Let me ask it another way, he says. If your transgressions are multiplied, what do you do to him? Rhetorical. Nothing. If you are righteous, what do you give him? Rhetorical. Nothing. What does he receive from your hand? Your wickedness, Elihu says, affects a man such as you. Your righteousness, a son of man. Elihu comes along and says, you know this assumption about the levers of heaven where you can actually affect God and his opinion and his actions by pulling levers and doing stuff and making sacrifices? That's a faulty assumption. You've bought a lie. That is actually not how God works. That's not how he deals with us. Elihu suggests that all of Job's assumptions about God were silly and of no account and has gotten him nowhere. Elihu says at one point, God is merciful and always wants to bring his people back from the edge of the pit. And he suggests that Job's assumptions about the levers of heaven have been damning him. They have amounted to a mortal sin. And that God, in bringing all of those assumptions to nothing, is saving Job's life. As if to emphasize the point, God himself shows up at the climax of the story and speaks to Job directly out of the whirlwind. And he addresses those assumptions that I've been talking about in a bone-chilling way. He says this, chapter 38. Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Who is this rattling on in my presence, purporting to know something about me and how my universe works? Listen to who I am. And then God goes into a long, divine tirade where we readers expect him to finally explain why he has done all these terrible things to this righteous man, Job. And instead, what he says is, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Rhetorical. Rhetorical. Answer, I hadn't made you yet. Where were you when I put Leviathan in the deep? Rhetorical. Where were you when I cast the heavens into their place? Rhetorical. Who is the God of this world? Rhetorical. God doesn't answer Job's petty little objections. God straightens out his assumptions. Gives him a brand new set of assumptions to work with. A brand new set of principles to see the world correctly with. The number one principle being, I am God, and you are one of my creatures. Godness is not on your list of things to get done today. 
There are no levers hanging down from my heaven because I don't want you sitting in the throne of the universe. And by the way, does God say that because he's uneasy with competition? No. He says that because it's dangerous to our souls to play the role of God in our lives, in our worlds, in our home schools. It's standing on the edge of a pit in which is perdition. God says in one of his lines when he's describing himself, he says, I take good care of all my creatures. I give them the breath they need to live. When it's time for them to die, I gently take it away. I provide food. I provide nourishment and shelter and raiment. I am their only secure provider. I am a God of love and mercy and faithfulness. And my faithfulness and mercy extends all the way to knocking down their idols when their idols threaten their souls. You don't want to be the God of this world. You'd screw it up. Let me take care of you. And in the short run, this is a very unpleasant experience for Job because what he finds out is all of my assumptions about life and parenting and teaching and education have been built on an idol. But in the long run, it is so sweet and comforting to Job. In the long run, he receives what I would call an education. He realizes that the educated man is not the master. That mastery is not the highest goal of education or of homeschooling, to put it in our idiom. Homeschooling's highest goal, it turns out, is not mastery. It's something else altogether. It's a game we can play that the government school knows nothing of. And it's the secret to the saving of our culture and our civilization. Listen to Job tell it. His response to God's whirlwind revelation is moving in the extreme. In fact, I hope I can read it to you without tearing up. Listen to this. Job claps his hand over his mouth and says, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you, and I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes." A shocking, devastating moment of self-realization. Job sees for the very first time who he really is in all of his frailty and weakness, his insufficiency and insignificance. He stands for the first time, really, at the limits of his own knowledge and sees where those limits really fall. He sees what a narrow ledge of knowledge and mastery he really stands on compared to this vast abyss of what he can never know. He receives an education. You know what God's response to Job's moment of, you know what? Here's what Job says. He claps his hand over his mouth and says, probably time for me to stop talking. Probably time for me to stop putting myself up as a master of this world and take my spot as a creature. You know what God's response to Job is? Good answer. Good answer. I can see God saying, I I see that my work, my merciful work in saving you is having its desired effect. I have brought you back from the pit. And God has Job lead his friends into a restoration of their good relationship with him by preaching, as it were, the gospel to his friends. A gospel of love and mercy. It's a two-sided gospel, isn't it? On the one hand, you cannot be the God of this world. And all of your efforts to be the God of this world or of your own little world are blasphemous idolatry. On the other hand, I love you. I'm not going to let you stay there. I will save you from blasphemous idolatry because of my great love and mercy. And since I'm so merciful, I will give you that lesson to give to your children. 
so that they can grow up. And in their minds, though they may master domains of knowledge from here to next Thursday, they will in their minds be humble men and women who know creaturehood as their proper place. Who look at every subject in the curriculum not as a domain of knowledge to master, but as another opportunity to see the love and mercy of the true master. This is a game the public school doesn't play. I think we spin our wheels, in a sense, by trying to beat the public school at its own game, by making better masters than they make. Let us instead, in all of our mastery, Seek the humility of Job. There is a God in heaven, Job learned in his one hour long lesson, and I am not he. And that God is worthy of our trust and our faith and our hope. Missy and I have found this lesson, the lesson of Job, to be so encouraging to us in our work as homeschoolers. There are one million ways, I wish I had all day to talk to you, about the ways that this lesson takes the burden off of your shoulders. Frees you up to teach and love your students with abandon. As if there were nothing riding on it, because in a very important sense, there isn't. Those students in your kitchen do not represent levers from heaven. They do not represent things that you grab with your two human hands and manipulate into the right spots so that blessing will rain down upon your family. There are no such levers. Those kids around your kitchen table are nothing more than opportunities for you to share the love of God and the word of God. And to share this lesson, if I had one hour and I I knew that my kids would know the lesson in one hour, this is the lesson I would want them to know. There's a God in heaven, Johnny, and it's not you. Not in math, not in science, not in rhetoric, not in Latin, not in basketball. You're a creature. But the God in heaven loves you. He's got his eye on you. He's got his hand on you. And in your working in all those subjects, in your pursuit of mastery in all those subjects, the God of heaven is for you. And everything that comes down the pike is an act of mercy at the hand of that God. I talk to teachers of all stripes all the time, and they often see this lesson and say, well, that sounds like a very literary lesson. Protagonists and rising action and climax of the story. I'm not really a lit person. I wonder if this lesson is possible for me. Which is another way of saying, I wonder if the curriculum that we're all pursuing actually lends itself to this lesson. Or is the curriculum we're pursuing geared towards some sort of mastery that's going to teach my kid to make an idol of his own knowledge? So I want to give you some suggestions for ways to frame this question, no matter what subject you're interested in. Not all of us are lit majors. Not all of us are lit teachers. Not all families are literary families. And that goes double, by the way, for theology and Bible study. Some of us feel really comfortable doing the lesson of Job with our families because we have read the Bible a lot and we're the Sunday school teacher every once in a while and we know how to do that. And some of us aren't. And some of us don't. But we all have subjects that we focus on in our homeschools, right? We all have subjects that might characterize our homeschool day more than others. Let me just suggest that this lesson is present everywhere, no matter what class we're talking about. Just a couple of surface, kind of frivolous ways that the, that the lesson is everywhere. Take the subject of math, by the way. The subject of mathematics. Here's a question for you. Why is zero undefined? Why is it illegal to divide by zero? Well, I don't know. It just is. It doesn't work. Math doesn't work if you allow division by zero. The rules for math, you see, exist outside you. They are what they are, regardless of your preference. 
When men invent rules for math, like making zero undefined, they do not create them. They merely discover them. Which, if you think about it for a minute, assumes that there's something out there in math that existed before you, beyond you, and will exist after you. How about grammar, or spelling, or phonics, or foreign language? What if foreign language is your bailiwick in your home school? Here's a question for you. Why are there four conjugations of Latin verbs? Wouldn't it have been easier if there was just the one? There is nothing more painful than learning that the rules for the four conjugations are all different. That is a ridiculous idea. Whoever thought Latin up should never have done that. Oh, wait a minute. Latin wasn't thought up. Grammar is merely a human attempt to organize what already exists. It exists outside of us. We cannot create it. All the attempts that there have ever been to create a new language have been imitations, incomplete, short imitations. How about the sciences? What if you're a science family? I get a lot of science families at the booth and they say, I know we need to do literature, but we're math science people. You don't understand. And I do understand. And it's a tough divide. I speak to math science people, as it were, from the other side of the brain. Well, here's a question from the science world. What holds the atom together? Have you had this question before, right? You know the nucleus of the atom, those tightly packed particles, packed so tightly that nothing's ever been packed as tightly as they're packed. You can hear a lit person talking about science right now. What are those particles? Well, at the high school physics level, they are protons, positively charged particles, and neutrons, neutrally charged particles. That's at the high school physics level. What happens, what do, what do like charges normally do? Well, they repel each other, obviously, and the, tightly, the more tightly they're being pushed together, the more strongly they repel. So why doesn't that happen in the nucleus of an atom? Why don't the nuclei of all atoms continually fly apart? Well, we don't really know. How's that? We don't really know. I mean, we're making some progress. There's some subatomic particles that's beyond my pay grade for sure. But the truth is that the explanation from Colossians is probably as good as anything else. In Christ Jesus, all things hold together. Which is, on the one hand, theologically, an answer to the question, and scientifically, a very nice way of saying, I have no idea. Because this world is not something I am ever going to master. I'm just a creature. How about this question? How about a question from ethics? Which is better? Which is better, to receive an injury or to give one? A question from the ancient Greek philosophers. Is it better to receive an injury or to give one? Why is it that we all say, oh, it's better to give one? And yet we all know that it's better to receive one. Because we are who we are. We can't actually make ourselves have the right answer to that question. The fact that there is a right answer to that question drives us outward to a reality that exists beyond us. Beyond our senses, beyond our assumptions. Here's one from economics. Say you're an economics teacher. That's kind of your fun little subject that you do. How is a pencil made? Anybody know this one? Anybody know how you make a pencil? Anybody ever read that essay from Leonard Reed? I, Pencil. Raise your hand if you've ever read that. I, Pencil. A few of you have. It's an essay, a first-person autobiography written by a pencil. And the pencil says, this is how I came to be. And he describes, this pencil does, all of the processes that go into making a single pencil. People from all over the world, resources from all over the world, technology and know-how from all over the world, people who know nothing about the existence of each other, never communicate with each other. Almost by magic, a pencil is created. And he makes the point that no one person has any idea how to make a pencil. It takes all of us working together, but not consciously working together, just being motivated by our own interests. A pencil sort of magically appears. Could anyone have created that process? The pencil says no. The free market, the principles of economics exist outside us. 
Here's a great one, and I'll end with this one. History. Why did the American Civil War take place? How about that for a question? Ask your 10th grader that. Sometimes we do ask our 10th graders that. We should be ashamed of ourselves. What a question. Why did the American Civil War take place? You might as well ask the question, did the American Civil War take place? For all you know. What do you know about what went on in Winston-Salem, North Carolina this morning? Between the hours of 7, let's make it easier, between the minutes of 7 and 7.01 this morning. How much do you know about what went down here this morning in that 60-second period of time? If you were to put everything that you know about that period as the numerator of a fraction and everything that actually happened during that period as the denominator, it would round down to zero. Right? And you have avenues of information. You could go find out a big, long list of things. How much do you know, relatively speaking, about what happened in 1857? Well, let me just tell you, it rounds down to zero. You know virtually nothing about history, statistically speaking. We should contemplate that every once in a while as we pursue being the masters of the whole wide world, as we build these images of ourselves as people that know everything. It's a good reminder, even as we pursue knowledge, even as we pursue mastery of our fields, and we do, it's a good reminder that statistically speaking, we know nothing. I want to suggest to you that incorporating that idea into your teaching will do your children a world of good. I want to suggest to you that embracing that idea in your own heart as a teacher, as a parent, will remove a load from your shoulders. One final story, I can't help it. I have to tell a story on my wife, Missy, who is my pride and joy, my partner in everything, and the smartest person I know. But she's also a type A homeschooler. And this gets her in a lot of trouble. She likes to be the master of her domain. She likes to have her hands on the levers. It's a real good feeling for her. She has to have them wrenched off by the hand of God every once in a while. And when our oldest son, Ian, was finishing junior high and heading into high school, now we're K through 12 homeschoolers, right? So the entrance into high school is a big moment. That's when you have to start writing it all down, right? That's when you have to develop the transcript. And she was a little worried in the summer before his freshman year about the whole transcript issue. And it was worse for her because our plan, we met in college we loved our alma mater, Hillsdale College in southern Michigan. And we always planned to send the kids back to Hillsdale. And Ian's going into his freshman year in high school, and we look over to Hillsdale, and we realize that some of our favorite professors are still teaching there. And we develop this fantasy. Wouldn't it be great if our teachers got our own students in their class? And our, our teachers could see our kids coming up and glorifying our names. <laughs> Boy, that Andrews. She really did a good job. Boy, that Andrew, she really did go from being an excellent student to being an excellent teacher. I think well of Andrews. You can giggle, but we actually thought that. It was very serious, it turns out. A serious error on our part turned into a serious sin against our son, to be perfectly frank. But in that summer, before he went off to, or before he started high school, she got a call from one of those professors who said, Missy, I hear that you're about to send a kid to Hillsdale or prepare to send a kid to Hillsdale, and I just wonder if there's anything that I can do in the way of curriculum to help you. And she said, yes. As a matter of fact, I've just been worrying about this all summer. What I need is a list of all the books that he needs to have read before he comes to college so that he will be ready to master the Western tradition. 
She didn't even know what she was saying. She had no idea how ridiculous that sounded coming out of her mouth because her hands were so firmly on the levers. I want to make sure that I get it all done and do it all right. And the professor said, oh, sure, I'll help you with that. She goes, oh, great, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. He goes, yeah, you got a pencil? She goes, what, you mean now? Oh, my goodness. And she goes, Ian, pencil, paper, stat. And she gets on the phone, and Ian runs and brings a legal pad and the paper, and she, got, she gets the paper and the pencil, and she goes, okay, head on the phone. She goes, okay, I'm ready. Professor Bauman, thank you so much for the call. Lay it on me. And he said, well, he should read the Bible. She said, write the Bible, of course, the Bible. Why didn't I think of that? She writes it down. He said, he should read Augustine's Confessions. She goes, Augustine's Confessions, right, of course. He's going in chronological order. I get it. Right. He should read something by John Milton, Paradise Lost. Paradise Lost, very good, okay, 16th century. I would have picked Shakespeare, but that's okay. We can do that too. She's writing it down. And then Professor Bowman says, he should read a book by a philosopher named Richard Mitchell called The Gift of Fire. She goes, The Gift of Fire, very good. I never heard of it, but that's why I'm calling you. Very good, excellent. La, 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 la. She goes, what is this gift of fire? And he said, it's a book about how education is not the completion of a book list. She goes, okay, good, I'll read it. <laughs> Sounds great. And she says, what next? He said, no, that's it. She goes, that's it. Very good, I got it. That's it. That's it? Professor Bauman, I really appreciate you calling, and you have no idea what this means to me, and I don't want to put too fine a point on this, but are you crazy? That's only four. What I asked for was a complete list of everything. I need him to read everything. He's got to be a master of everything, or he will fail by which she meant, or I will be a failure. And he said, Missy, you don't understand. That's not what education is. That's not what you're really trying to do. You want to make a human soul out of him. You want him to be confronted in the Bible, in Augustine's Confessions, in Paradise Lost, You want him to be confronted with the fact that there is a God in heaven and he can never know what that God knows. He can never be the master that that God is. He's going to be happy and prosperous and influential if he is a humble man, not just in his heart, but in his head. Take every opportunity you can to teach him how to learn that lesson and you will have succeeded admirably. And I got to tell you, that conversation changed our lives because we had been... Curriculum list junkies. And if you knew Missy, you would nod with a knowing nod. We had been curriculum list junkies, and we had pursued the completion of a curriculum every year with amazing energy. And the discouragement and the weight and the burden of all that pursuit by February every year was a giant boulder. And by April and May, she was looking at me. This is an experienced homeschooler. She's really good. By April and May, she looks at me and says, I'm done. Forget this. This is ridiculous. Let's put him in the government school. I'm a failure. I'm a fraud. This is too hard. This conversation had the effect of lifting that burden to a degree and setting her free to love those kids with the gifts and talents that she's been given. And I hope that this conversation about the book of Job and about the assumptions about what education is and our own sinful assumptions that cloud that vision will encourage you as well that that burden maybe will lift off of your shoulders just for a minute. And you can see yourself as a creature just like your students, a fellow learner with your students. There is no lever hanging down from heaven that you have to pull. Pursue the subjects that interest you and them with abandon. There's not as much writing on it as you thought there was. Thanks again for allowing me to speak to you. I'll say again what I said at the beginning. You are my heroes. And I think the future of our civilization, because it's in your hands, is in good hands. If there's anything I can do to help in your noble work, please let me know. I hope you have a great weekend. And thanks again for listening.